Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Michael Ayala in tonight for Vinnie Politan. Now, next week, jury selection will begin in the murder trial of three men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. And this case and the video at the center of this case is somewhat of a raw shock test for those who watch it, depending on which side of the story you reside. And the positions are well summed up by the attorneys on both sides. Prosecutors say the unarmed 25-year-old black man was merely out for a jog when he was chased down and fatally shot by the defendants, the victim of a racially motivated crime. Attorneys for the defendants, however, Travis McMichael and his father Gregory and neighbor William Roddy Bryan, say the three men were trying to make a citizen's arrest and shot Arbery in self-defense. Ted Rollins has the story. In the first few seconds of the Ahmad Arbery shooting video, it's clear that Roddy Bryan, the person recording, is also driving. Five seconds in, we see Ahmad for the first time. He appears to be running at a consistent pace. At nine seconds, we get the first look at the truck stopped in the road. The driver's side door is open. The man standing outside is Travis McMichael. He is armed with a shotgun. Standing in the back of the truck is Travis's father, Greg. He's armed with a handgun. Two things to notice here as the camera starts to move erratically. Watch Ahmad as he appears to realize what's in front of him. He decides to go around the truck on the right-hand side to avoid Travis. Now, watch it again and think about Roddy Bryan, who is shooting the video. He keeps driving towards the evolving situation and then listen. That sound raises the question, is Brian cocking a handgun from inside the car? Brian maintains he was unarmed. As we break down the next sequence frame by frame, we see Ahmad on the passenger side of the McMichaels pickup. In the next frame, we can only see Greg McMichael, who appears to be holding a phone in his ear with his left hand. We know his right hand is holding a pistol. Now we see that Travis McMichael has moved from the driver's side to the front of the truck with his shotgun, presumably to confront Ahmad. His right leg shows his knees are bent, his head is looking forward. In the next frame, we see Travis has now stepped back, and this is when we hear the first gunshot. The next frame clearly shows that Travis is being pushed back and Armad has his hands on the rifle. Watch as Ahmad releases his hands and hits Travis, first with his left hand, then with his right, as the struggle moves out of frame. Greg, meanwhile, now in the back of the pickup, puts his phone down and appears to ready his pistol. Then another shot. And we see smoke coming from the struggle. At 27 seconds into the video, Travis and Ahmad can be seen again struggling over the rifle. Watch right here. Ahmad pulls his right hand off to try to hit Travis. This gives way to the final shot. The final frame of the 36-second video shows father and son each holding a firearm standing in the street with Ahmad Arbery laying on the ground dying. All right, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae is joining us now live from Brunswick, Georgia. And I understand late in the day today, Julia, we actually got uh, a response from the judge regarding those jailhouse calls. There had been motions by both sides to try, well, at least the defense was trying to exclude them. But it sounds like the judge didn't side with the defense. The judge has denied that motion to exclude and is going to allow prosecutors, if they choose, to bring in certain jail calls that were recorded between these defendants and other people on the outside. Here's a listen to one of those jail calls that we already saw this prosecution use rather expertly during the bond hearing earlier in the year. Take a listen. She has got to stop. She will. Can get rid of that, that uh, stuff. Yeah. Make it disappear, make it go away, because people are yeah. accessing it. If not, it's, it's liable to really screw us up. Well, what stuff are you talking about? I mean, her, really? post, her post on Facebook. And, and She's not she, posting anymore. Well, it doesn't matter. They'll go back and look and she has posted. You remember all the crap we saw on her on her phone when we had it? Yep. Yep. It's, that's too late, Greg. They've already got all that. But no, they don't. They don't have, already have all of it. There's people trying to get it all the time, and there's still there's still stuff out there that they haven't gotten. She's got to close out those accounts and get off of them. She did close out those accounts. 
No, she didn't. She shut them down, but she didn't close them out. She didn't completely eliminate them. She just put them on hold. That's a conversation between Gregory McMichael and his wife. They're talking about those posts that his daughter put up. And the way the prosecutors use this is they said that uh, he is obstructing justice from inside of the jail, trying to get rid of evidence. And we know what the judge did as far as his bond. It was revoked and he is still in jail. Uh, we have a look at some of those arguments that this defense made trying to get these jail calls out. They said that it violated the due process. The judge found it did not violate the due process of or did not violate due process in this case. And that there was an argument about the 14th Amendment right to equal protection, that they are being treated differently as inmates. Judge found that that was not a violation. Also, spousal privilege, that conversation between the husband and wife that is often traditionally protected. You can't compel one to come in and testify against the other. In this case, the judge said uh, these calls don't violate spousal privilege, noting that they knew that these calls were being recorded, so they weren't trying to keep them confidential. And also, it does not violate the defendant's expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment. Michael. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it was an uphill battle for the defense because, again, it really boils down to that expectation of privacy. And they know that or they knew or should have known that those calls were being recorded. All right, Julian, I know you're up there for jury selection, which begins next week. Of course, we'll be covering that. What is the latest in jury selection? Right now, everything is being geared up here in Glen County, Georgia, to make sure that things are ready for jury selection when it begins. The logistics are going to be a bit different than a typical trial. Surely for a typical trial here in this courthouse, they're going to be bringing in a pool of over 100 people, and they will be questioning them in three different locations. They'll be getting that number down smaller after they ask them those general questions and then move into individual voir dire. Uh, we know that uh, this court has also sent out a jury questionnaire to all of these jurors. So the parties likely have some background on these potential jurors and what they already know about the case. That was, of course, front and center on that questionnaire as far as what they wanted to know before these men and women come in for questioning. All right. Now, Julia, are they anticipating a heavy spectator presence at the trial? And what have you heard about security measures? Absolutely expecting crowds of people. As far as what's going to happen inside of the courtroom, there is going to be an overflow room for those who don't fit in the courtroom. But we've seen that at all of these pretrial hearings, the bond hearings, there was always a heavy, not only media presence, but a large group of supporters for the family of Ahmad Arbery who show up to this courthouse. We know that they're planning a rally for this weekend. And even coming into the courthouse or court, court uh, area. There's a complex with several courthouses. There's a historic one. But a few blocks away, you see this large mural of Ahmad Arbery's face that is on the side of a store, a building. And you can imagine that people will be passing that as they come here to this area in Brunswick, Georgia. So they are anticipating it. As far as security, we haven't been made privy to what those measures are going to be, but we can expect this court is preparing to make sure not only the jurors are protected, but outside of the courthouse that the demonstrators will also be protected. 